Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib, and we're taking a look today at the new Asus ROG Ally. This is a handheld gaming PC from Asus, and what's interesting about this one is that it's probably the first handheld PC that's available at scale here in the U.S. You can walk into Best Buy and get one of these things right off the shelf, which is a first, I think, for this class of computer. And this is running Windows 11 with a new AMD processor that is very powerful. And what we're going to do in this video is take a look at this thing, mostly from the standpoint of what it's like to use it. We'll, of course, look at its performance, but it feels a little rough around the edges to me right now, primarily because its operating system wasn't designed for this form factor. And that adds some frustration, especially for a product that's really available at mass market retail. But there are some things that I like about this device quite a bit, not the least of which its performance. And we're going to dive into all of that in just a second. But I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that I paid for this with my own funds. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. No one is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what this device is all about. Now, the price point on the one we're looking at today comes in at $699. I had read earlier that there might be a slightly less powerful version for less money, but checking today, both the Asus Store and Best Buy only has this version. Now this has that powerful processor I mentioned, the AMD Z1 Extreme. As you'll see in a few minutes, it is much more powerful than the Steam Dex processor, but given the screen size, you may not be gaining all that much here by spending more than what a Steam Deck costs for a handheld gaming PC, but I'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, this also has 16 gigabytes of RAM, LPDDR5 RAM to be exact, along with a 512 gigabyte NVMe 4.0 SSD. ETA Prime on his channel was able to upgrade that SSD so you can put more storage to bear on it later. Additionally, you have an SD card slot here at the top. And this is a UHS-2 compatible slot, and those cards do perform pretty well. So if you are looking to get some additional storage for this, what I would suggest, again, is to look for a UHS-2 card and also look for one that has an A2 on it for the best performance. It won't be as fast as that NVMe will be, but it will be pretty zippy uh, for most of the games that you might want to install on this. So that's what I would do on a storage upgrade side of things is look for one of those UHS-2 cards. But again, you can go in and replace the SSD if you want. Now the display on this is a seven inch display, very similar to the Steam Deck screen, although this one is running at 1080p and it supports up to 120 hertz for its refresh rate, which is great. However, as powerful as this processor is, there are very few current games that will push beyond 60 frames per second here, but some of the older games that you can run at higher frame rates will look very nice on this. Now, it also supports AMD FreeSync, so you should have very smooth gameplay even if your frame rate is jumping around a bit, but the response rate of the display is rather high at 7 milliseconds. Typically, with gaming displays, you want that number as low as possible, and the result is that you'll have a lot of motion blur on screen when you've got fast moving scenes. You'll especially notice when you're dragging windows around here on the desktop that it doesn't feel as smooth as it might on a gaming display that has a lower response rate. So just be aware of that. But beyond those issues, it is a very nice display and it runs at 500 nits of brightness as well. Now the build quality on this isn't bad. It is all plastic, but it's a nice high quality plastic. It's pretty rigid. It doesn't flex or creak even when you're holding it with one hand like this. It comes in at 608 grams or 1.34 pounds, a little lighter than the Steam Deck. And most of the weight is centered in the middle here, so it's evenly distributed across your two hands. So it's pretty comfortable to hold. It doesn't feel all that heavy. My only gripe with it, though, are these buttons here on the back. They stick out quite far, and I'm having a hard time getting a good grip that doesn't have me kind of getting underneath these buttons and risking snapping them off. So I would have preferred that they went with the Steam Deck design here, where those buttons are more flush to the case and you can get a more comfortable grip. On the Steam Deck, I just kind of disabled those buttons so I can you know, push them without any consequences. But on here, they just stick out and get in the way, and that is impacting my comfort on this one. So let's move on now to the control surfaces, and I do have some gripes here. Let's start with the analog sticks. They feel a bit loose to me. They snap back okay. 
They do have more travel than the Steam Deck does, but when you're moving the sticks here, as you can see, there's a pretty sizable dead zone before anything gets registered. So a lot of that excess travel kind of gets wasted by the fact that nothing really gets registered until you get just about to here uh, before things start happening. But I have a major gripe with the directional pad on this. It feels cheap to me. It reminds me a lot of what you might find on an Xbox controller from a control standpoint. So if you're somebody who's playing a lot of 8-bit retro games, what you'll find here is just what you saw there, a lot of errant diagonals happening because it doesn't take much movement to register a diagonal on this D-pad because it is an eight-way D-pad. So there might be some modern games that benefit from something like this, but from the retro side, it's not very accurate, and I think the Steam Deck's D-pad does much better. I'm gonna minimize this real quick and pull back up my game controller tester because I also wanted to show you the analog stick. It doesn't take much movement to get it to 100% here, and I still have a lot of room left to go, so there's a dead zone at the end of it <laughs> versus the uh, stick where you get a lot at the beginning of its movement. So not great here on the analog controls. I think they could probably tweak it maybe with firmware updates or whatever, but for the most part, the controls leave a lot to be desired, but you do get a cool uh, RGB LED on there, and that's something. Now, another gripe I've got involves its USB-C port on the top. It is a full service port, so you can get power in, video out, and data devices to all share a single cable on a docking station. But the USB technology this supports is only USB 3.2, not USB 4. And the reason why I like USB 4 is that it's compatible with Thunderbolt. And now if you buy an AMD laptop with USB 4, you can connect Thunderbolt GPUs or a Thunderbolt box with any PCI Express card in it. You could do video capture, for example. And unfortunately, this is just plain old USB 3.2 that doesn't support any of that stuff. In place of USB 4, they use their own proprietary connector here. And although this does have more bandwidth than USB 4, your choices are more limited. So the only options that I could see on the ASUS website right now is a GPU that costs $2,000 and another external GPU that costs $800. You can't build your own with this connector as far as I can see. So I was a bit disappointed with this because this does limit your choices. And had this had a USB 4 port on the top, this would have been a killer device because you could connect all sorts of stuff up to it. And it does pack a lot of CPU power in a very small form factor. So a uh, big disappointment there. I was expecting more out of that port. But it does have a headphone jack, so you do have that going for you there. You got your volume rocker over here. And then you have a power button that also has a fingerprint reader on it, so you don't have to futz around with the touch display to get in while keeping your system secure. Now, I will say the out-of-the-box experience on this is not great. When I took it out of the box and turned it on for the first time, the on-screen keyboard didn't activate and I couldn't get it connected to my Wi-Fi. I ended up turning it off and turning it back on again and that somehow got everything working. Once it did boot up, there were a ton of updates, both on the Windows side, but also through the Ammo Crate software that Asus has pre-installed on it. So plan for about an hour or two of just getting things updated so you can get the best performance out of the device. I have had two BIOS updates in the course of a day here, so I think they're pushing out a lot of stuff now that this is getting out uh, to retail. So just be aware of that. You're going to be updating Windows. You're going to be updating Ammo Crate. And part of the issue here is that this is a Windows machine after all. So everything that you're doing runs on top of Windows. And I did find the interface on the Steam Deck just to be a lot more polished because they make the operating system and the operating system they're running is designed for the hardware. Here, you've got software running on top of an operating system that's designed for laptops and desktops. And I think it'd be great for Microsoft to offer some kind of gaming interface, not only for a handheld like this, but also for somebody sitting at their TV with a game controller. At some point, they might do that, and I think the usability would get a lot better here. Uh, but for now, there is always going to be Windows kind of interfacing with your uh, gameplay experience here. So for example, if I go ahead and boot up um, no Man's Sky through the software, you'll see Windows popping up here, Steam's got to get loaded, uh, and you will keep having to sometimes go into the Windows interface to do something. So much so that I've been walking around with my portable keyboard trackpad here just because it's easier to get things typed in and navigated with this 
versus the very tiny display and the game controller. So just be prepared for that. It's not all that polished just yet. But the Ammo Crate software isn't bad, so let's take a look at that. So shortly after you log into Windows, what will happen next is the Ammo Crate software from Asus will boot up. I found it does a very good job of locating games on your device and putting them on the screen. So every one of these games got detected automatically and was placed on here. I can also access some of the game platforms directly. So if I wanted to take a look at my Game Pass games, for example, I can click on Xbox here and that will boot up the Xbox app. But again, this is more suited for a keyboard and mouse interface than it is for a game controller interface. Let me pop back in here though. And one other thing they've got are profiles that you can configure for each game. As far as I can see, this doesn't adjust the game settings. You'll have to do that manually in each game. But if I go over here to No Man's Sky, for example, and hit X, I can set up key mapping, what all the sticks do here. I can also set the operating mode for the device. And this is a key one here, which is the operating mode when you're on AC or DC. AC is when you're plugged into the wall. DC is when you're running off of battery. And a lot of the activity on this device from a configuration standpoint is not only the settings of the game, but the settings of the hardware. Because what you want to do here is figure out uh, what good mix of power and settings get you to where you want to be. Now, for me, I like running the games as best as I can. So the turbo mode is what I want to do there. But that will severely limit your battery life. I'm looking at maybe 90 minutes out of this thing when I'm running it at full blast and playing a game like No Man's Sky. You might even see less battery life than that. So to get more battery life, you got to turn down the operating mode. And that, of course, uses less power, but that comes at the cost of performance. So you're constantly battling all those things, especially if you want longevity. The Steam Deck isn't much better in this area. You get maybe two hours out of a game on that. It's just the nature of these processors and how much power you can carry around with you. Uh, so just be aware of that. But beyond that, I think the interface here is probably the best they can do uh, given what uh, Windows is doing behind the scenes here. So again, when you boot this up, it will find most of your games and you can get at them through this, but just be prepared to navigate some Windows interfaces to log in and validate yourself. But you do have the ability to tweak how the system operates through the settings tab. Let's take a look at that. You hit your right trigger here to get there. And if we go over to operating mode, they have a good description of what each of these modes does. So right now I've got it in the turbo mode, which is the highest power consuming, but also the best performance. They've got a more balanced mode here called performance that tries to keep everything down the middle. You have a silent mode, which kind of turns most of the performance off and keeps the device running at a relatively low rate of speed. But again, you get more battery life there or you can have Windows control the performance settings. But they also have a manual mode here where you can jump in and set things a little bit more granularly. So you can adjust uh, some settings here and kind of dial in fan performance and get things to where you want them to be. But for me, because I want the most all the time, I just leave it in turbo. The fan noise on this isn't that bad. It will, of course, kick on when you are placing the system under load but it's not any worse than the Steam Deck is, and it's just kind of a cost of doing business when you've got a system this small. You're gonna have a loud fan kind of driving things there. Uh, you can adjust the lighting of the sticks here and a few other things. Now, they also have an overlay that you can bring up at any time to adjust some of the system settings, and you do that by pushing this button here, and that'll pull it up. So, for example, I can adjust the operating mode here on the fly. I can do some other things like activating the real-time performance monitor, which we'll be looking at as well and of course adjust screen brightness and volume and everything too. So it's kind of nice to have that, which you can get at very, very quickly to adjust your power levels or uh, get some other things adjusted. So altogether, the Ammo Crate software I think is very good. It's just that Windows has to be part of it and it would have been nice to see a more seamless interface. But with all that out of the way, it performs exceptionally well. So let's take a look and see how it does. So let's take a look at Forza Horizon 5 here first. This is a game that I downloaded from my Game Pass Ultimate account. And on the Steam Deck, you can, of course, run these games provided you install Windows first. Here, because the device is natively running Windows, it's a lot easier to get those Windows games up and running, which was a main uh, selling point for me. I do enjoy my Game Pass games. Uh, this controller is also X input compatible. So on the Steam Deck, when you do get Windows installed, you have to put some additional software on for controller compatibility. Here, everything just kind of works out of the box, which was really nice to have. 
And the game is running pretty good too. I'm running at 1080p at the medium settings and I'm doing about 60 frames per second. It'll sometimes dip a little below 60, but generally hovering in that range at the native display resolution, which is great. What's also cool, as you'll see, is I've got my docking station attached here. So the dock is powering the unit here. My ethernet is working through the dock. Now I'm also able to send video out of the dock and that's what you're seeing here. So I'm basically mirroring the onboard display to my larger one here. And one of the advantages of the more powerful processor that you'll find on the Ally versus the Steam Deck is that you can run games at decent frame rates at 1080p and you'll see a lot more detail on a larger display now because although 720p is fine on a seven inch display, you don't miss all the detail, you can definitely tell the difference when you blow that 720p up on a larger screen. So here you're able to really run at a kind of Xbox Series S level of resolution on either the handheld display or the external display or both. And I think that's a key advantage here thanks to the much more powerful processor. Basically what I found is that this will run games at 1080p that the Steam Deck can do at 720p at a decent frame rate. And if you are doing a lot of capturing or doing dual display like this, I think there's some real advantages to that. Let's take a look at a few other games. Now here's a more demanding game. This is Red Dead Redemption 2. Now of course on my Steam Deck I run this at 720p and I usually get in the 30 frames per second category, maybe a little bit better from time to time. Here I'm running it at 1080p but at the absolute lowest settings and I'm getting about 40 frames per second right now. I find that it hovers in the high 30s to low 40s. Very, very playable. Playable at a higher resolution than you can get on the Steam Deck. Uh, but again, it's not going to rival what you'll get out of a more powerful gaming PC with a discrete GPU. But still pretty cool to be able to up the resolution here, especially if you plan to capture the video as well. So we had Forza 5 running from my Game Pass account. We had Red Dead Redemption 2 running from Steam. Now I've got Death Stranding here, a freebie that I got on my Epic Games account running. I have it at 1080p at medium settings and I'm doing about 50 frames per second, give or take. It's sometimes dropping into the high 30s, low 40s and sometimes going as high as 50 here. So this will vary a bit, although having that variable refresh rate display certainly helps. And it looks pretty good here and it plays pretty good, again, at the native resolution of the display. So I think the performance here is really solid, even though I have some gripes about the device overall. And let's take a look now at the 3 d Mark Time Spy benchmark test and see how it did there. And this test really exemplifies the difference a year can make when it comes to PC technology. So the Ally here scored 3,064 on that test to the Steam Deck's 1,741. And you can see uh, just how much more graphics performance and CPU performance we're getting out of this Z1 Extreme. I would love to see this chip in a laptop. Speaking of laptops, take a look at the Yoga C940 from a couple of years back. That had a GTX 1650 GPU and that's performing at about the same level that this handheld is with a single chip and far less power consumption. So it's really remarkable what the Z1 is capable of. And again, the difference here is that we can run games at decent frame rates at 1080p versus 720p on the Steam Deck. But honestly, if you are mostly using your Steam Deck in handheld mode, you're not going to notice all that much of a difference on a 7-inch display between 720p and 1080p. But you can also use the Ally's small screen to your advantage by running your games at 720p. You're not going to notice that much of a visual quality difference, but you will notice a much higher frame rate on those games versus the Steam Deck. So for example, this is No Man's Sky running at 720p with the standard settings, and we're getting 75 to 80 frames per second here, whereas on the Steam Deck we're usually around 60 or a little bit lower than 60 with the same settings at the same resolution. And as expected, emulation is very nice on this device and you've got access to all the Windows emulators that are out there. This is uh, the GameCube emulator called Dolphin running and it's running just perfectly, at least with this game, full frame rate. Uh, no issues or slowdowns or anything else going on here and I probably have a lot of room to spare on the processor as you can see here to 
boost the resolution and image quality. ETA Prime did a great video going through a lot of high-end emulation on this device, so I'm going to point you at his video for that, but I think the power of the Z1 Extreme here uh, will be put to good use if you are looking to do some more advanced emulation. Now on the 3D Mark stress test, we did get a failing grade of 93.6%. So if you run this thing at heavy load over a long period of time, you might see some throttling on it. I think that's also the case on the Steam Deck in certain situations as well. But I think for the most part in my experience, I haven't seen a lot of noticeable slowdown on this one. And it feels like it's performing quite well even if it has some areas that can be improved from a software and hardware standpoint. So I'm kind of mixed on this one. I was really excited about it because I thought it would be a nice alternative to the Steam Deck. I don't know if it really is, partly because the control surface isn't all that great on it. It really feels kind of clunky in how you interact with it. That's not all Asus's fault. They have to run Windows in order for this thing to work. So I think there's some things that maybe Microsoft can do to improve the lean back and handheld uh, gaming interface for Windows. And I think if they were to address those things, I'd be a little more favorable on this. But there's no denying that the performance here is exceptional. And I really can't wait to see what we get with these AMD chips, maybe in laptops at some point because I don't think I've seen a single chip device perform as well as this one outside of some of the Apple Silicon stuff. But that said, I'm not ready to throw out my Steam Deck just yet. I really like how the Steam Deck interacts with its operating system. It just feels like a more cohesive product, primarily because when it has an update, it updates itself once like a Switch or any other game console would, as opposed to having to hunt around in the operating system for some updates, hunt around in Asus's app for others. It just doesn't feel all that cohesive to me. But it performs really well, and I think if you are looking for something that offers the best handheld performance, there's nothing better at the moment than this device. That's going to do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Brian Parker, Chris Allegretta, Hot Sauce and Video Games, Logic AGR, Tom Albrecht, and Amda Brown. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.